As you know, alcohol and drug abuse is becoming more and more prevalent in today's society. But we would all like to believe that the people responsible for saving lives are immune to the kind of things that are killing people all around them. Unfortunately, that's not true. Medical professionals are as prone to having these same problems as anyone else, and sometimes even more so. Now, how would you know if your own doctor was impaired? I'm Eleanor Shino. In just a few moments, you are going to meet a doctor who is recovering from his own addiction to alcohol and drugs. He's going to talk about how big this problem is in the medical community and how to recognize the symptoms in your doctor. That's coming up on tonight's edition of AgeWise Weekly. meeting my guest tonight, a highly regarded emergency room physician and internist for more than two decades, and now one of North America's, uh, well, best-selling authors of medical suspense fiction. Now, he's here tonight to discuss his own struggle with alcohol and drug addiction. First, uh, we have to, to mention the fact that Dr. Michael Palmer has written this book that uh, is, is actually, it's Dr. Palmer, your, your seventh novel, it's right? It's my seventh one. Okay, and, uh, and this one's just out, and we understand that it made the, the Wall Street Journal's bestsellers list yes, today. Barnes & Noble bestseller list. Well, congratulations. Thank you for joining us. We have to talk about those some serious things, and we'll talk about your, your novel a little later. Thanks. Errors in hospitals are probably more common than, than any of us want to believe, but I guess few errors have received the attention of the uh, errors in Tampa, Florida last week. Uh, in case you haven't heard it, uh, a man who uh, went in for his uh, an amputation of a left foot, he woke up from the anesthetic and his right foot had been amputated. Turned out that two days later, the left foot still had to uh, had to go, and so this man is without both feet. Same hospital, um, patient was taken off a respirator, right. wrong patient, and the patient died. How common is this? Well, I don't think it's that common, but certainly mistakes in hospitals are extremely common. Uh, the problem is and again I, I would never defend the system but the problem is that people who are in hospitals are sick they require a lot of attention and a lot of things to be done to make sure that they go on the path to being well and there are a lot of people involved in their care and and at a, almost any place along the line a person could be distracted a person could um, have something going on in their personal life a person could be human uh, and a mistake can be made and that mistake could be lethal Doctor, you are a physician. You are now an author. You've, you've written this book. Uh, I think on page 60 of the book, uh, your main character says, quote, I have seen the errors. I have experienced what goes on in a hospital. And the main character, by the way, is a doctor, to the point that I would never want to be a patient. Absolutely. Um, I, I don't mean to undermine confidence in the American medical system, but uh, certainly uh, we should try and be as careful as we can in choosing the place we go and the caregivers who, uh, who work with us, but we certainly can't choose um, the nurse who takes care of us on the uh, 11 to 7 graveyard shift. We can't choose um, the, the new intern who happens to just show up at the hospital. And, and so in a way there's, there's no sense in in fretting about this uh, to the point well, where... Is it, is it a patient's family's responsibility? If we have a, a, a family member who's critically ill, should we make sure that we sit there and, and we monitor the, the well, care? I think it's the hospital's responsibility to um, constantly run um, in-service training sessions for the people that work there, to, to have a reputation for um, delivering uh, compassionate and careful care. Uh, I don't know who these people were that made the mistakes in Tampa, but they're very frightening mistakes to me. But there are smaller errors, a medication error here and there, um, a bed rail that's left down, and all of a sudden the patient's on the floor with a broken hip. This kind of thing can happen all the time under the stress of what goes on in hospitals no, at, at night. At the same time, uh, there's, there's a Senate bill uh, uh, for now proposing that there uh, be a cap 
put on damages that, that a, a patient can receive. Uh, there are a lot of people who feel that maybe Congress should be uh, addressing a more serious problem, which is making more doctors and hospitals more accountable for their mistakes. Well, again, I, I can speak about physicians, uh, perhaps even more than hospitals, although I obviously have spent my life working in a hospital. Uh, I think that, that states certainly have an obligation to turn their attention to um, trying to identify doctors who need help. Now, not necessarily doctors who are drug and alcohol dependent, we can talk about that, but uh, our state is doing a remediation program where they're now starting to look for what I consider to be the really dangerous doctors, the ones who don't care, the ones who are um, callous, the ones who um, have lost their love for the patients they take care of, the ones who have prejudices against fat people or old people or sick people. There are doctors How do you, how do you have, identify these people? Well, there are ways because, remember, every one of them, has, it's not a, um, an isolated uh, cave that they work in. They come to work every day and people in hospitals see them. And, and we can begin to send out questionnaires to, to the professional staff saying, what are these doctors mm -hmm. like? Could you grade this doctor in terms of A, B, C, or D? These Dr. Are Palmer, important things. you left the medical profession to become a fiction writer, but it wasn't a smooth transition. You want to take us through it? Well, I never really left. I'm still practicing and uh, have, have never stopped. But what happened to me was that uh, I, as a medical student, was this um, hard-working, hard-driving, hard-drinking uh, student. Yeah, that's, A's, that's what you um, say. You say, and a lot of people out there can identify with this. Uh, boy, I was a hard-drinking son of a gun. I mean, I just, you know, I worked hard and I had a couple of drinks every night and... I, I, I deserved it. Right. That's exactly what I used to keep saying to myself. I deserve to feel good. And, uh, and I was normal as far as I was concerned. I was just like everybody else, but I didn't really realize that I wasn't like everybody else, that I was always the one who passed out at the end of the parties, that I was always the one who had to be told what he did the next day. Mm -hmm. um, but I, again, uh, I graduated uh, with honors from my, one of the best med schools in the country, um, went to Harvard to train, um, still behaving exactly in the same way, um, got the best uh, internship, the best residency, but uh, was feeling a tremendous emptiness inside me that only seemed to feel better when I was drinking. Okay, when did you discover you were an alcoholic? It took a long time. I was in tremendous denial. I, uh, when I went into private practice, uh, I began taking pills to get up with, pills to go to sleep with that night, still denying that I had any problem and still saying so, I So you were cross-addicted? Oh yeah, I think that many, many people, especially physicians who are alcoholics, and, and alcohol is by far our worst problem, um, end up being cross-addicted. More doctors, alcoholics than I don't drug think addicts? So. Uh, oh, many more are, are their That's drug I mean, of choice is alcohol, by far. Okay. But there's a larger percentage of physicians who dabble and, and become dependent on It's so on easy, pills. isn't it's it? It's available. It's so available to you. How, how, did, how did you get your drugs? Did you just write out well, prescriptions I will for yourself? tell you, I did. And I will tell you that it's not as available as it once was in that the computers now track things a lot quicker. Doctors can't order narcotics from, a, say, a discount house. Um, and, and to any doctor who's listening, I would say that uh, sooner rather than later, you're going to get caught. But, you know, but doctor, you say that you were never aware that your addiction might harm your patients, although now looking back, you think that that, that oh, a possibility? Oh, absolutely. I think that any time that someone's um, impaired, and I hate that word, but uh, not as sharp as they would be normally, either from fatigue, mm -hmm. mental illness, physical illness, drug or alcoholism, the chances are that they're not functioning at 100%. Um, but many, many chemically dependent physicians, and I'm certainly one of them, um, in a way make up for it by working so much harder, and that's what I was doing. I, I would push myself to the limit and then push myself beyond. My patients love me. At the, at the height of my illness, I was calling them at 11 o'clock at night to make sure they were okay. Do you think any of them suspected that no. you were addicted? I don't think so. Uh, in retrospect, a few of them have told me they were worried about me because I didn't look good. Um, I, I was acting a lot tired or more distracted, all the things that, you know, perhaps I would warn patients to, to look for in their own physicians. Dr. Michael Palmer, you really hit bottom before you started back up again, It was a you? bad day at Black Rock for me, but again, it was 16 years ago now, and I've devoted uh, my professional life uh, to working with physicians with problems similar to the ones that I had back then, and uh, the writing is has been a great diversion for me and now it's it's it started out to be your therapy and now it's it's a love it's isn't way it? I, way six eight three one six hundred our phone lines are open if you would like to speak to dr michael palmer the author of silent treatment and uh... his own story a very inspirational one we're going to be back to take your phone calls right after this
conversation with the six pillars of Perry Mason in The Case of the Bartered Bikini. One, Perry takes on Kitty, a model accused of murder. She's young, pretty, helpless. And I know I've given all the wrong answers. Two, she looks really guilty. Then I heard Kitty shout, let me go. And I heard her say, I hate you, I could kill you. Yikes. But three, Perry's knowing look. There, there it is. The light went on. Four, Perry moves in for the kill. Miss Wainwright, wasn't all this not what Mr. Attlee did, but what you did? Five, the confession. He was in no condition to drive. I'd already killed him. Cue the music. And the swimsuit modeling party is the site for six. Perry's wrap-up. Pay attention, Paul. The cases change, but the six pillars of Perry Mason justice remain the same. Catch them weeknights at 10, here on WQEX. Sit back and tour England's greatest art museums with your guide, Sister Wendy Beckett, a 63-year-old nun who spent the last 12 years in solitude, devoted to the study of art. I must confess that I have a problem with this picture. Not because of the picture. I think it's one of those magical pictures ever painted. The problem is me. I really can't find the words to tell you how magical it is. Don't miss Sister Wendy's Odyssey, tonight at 10.50, here on WQEX. Welcome back. My guest tonight is Dr. Michael Palmer. He's uh, the author of Silent Treatment. Uh, he is a physician, an emergency room physician at one time, an internist, uh, a uh, recovering drug addict and alcoholic. How typical is your story? Oh, very, very typical. Um, the biggest deal is, the, starting from the very beginning, uh, um, a very aggressive uh, young person who, um, desperate for approval, working as hard as they can with no real idea of why they're driving themselves, but uh, an expanding feeling of emptiness and worthlessness inside that nothing that I ever did was enough. Well, you talk to doctors, and I speak now to um, three of the medical schools in Boston uh, where I, I live, um, to try and get the students to understand that they need to develop their spiritual selves at the same time that they're developing their scientific selves, or things are going to break down for them. And that's what happened with me. Doctor, you, you told us a few moments ago that, that uh, your, your patients loved you. They really were not suspicious that uh, you were abusing drugs and alcohol. Do you think that perhaps there should be random drug testing for physicians in hospitals? I think that it wouldn't hurt. Okay, it's uh, everyone. Every time random drug testing comes up in any profession, everyone bolts back and says that oh, this is an invasion of uh, of my privacy. Obviously, the the technical aspects of it have got to be worked out very carefully. But uh, I think in terms of um, improving public confidence in hospitals and hospital employees, I think everyone who works in a hospital, if we could afford it should be tested. Now we're talking about a very, very, very expensive program in an area of, uh, of life that's already we're, you but know, if we can test debate. people who make widgets in factories, we certainly should be able to I, test I don't physicians who are uh, operating on, on patients. And, and, and it's, it's really a very serious problem, uh, especially where surgeons are concerned. I, I certainly feel more that education and outreach is more important than, um, than, say, random testing. But I don't deny that there might be a place for testing people that work in hospitals and physicians. Okay. I, I would prefer education and saying, hey, here we are. Um, we, you can call us. Dr. Yeah. Michael Palmer, we have a caller on line seven. Go ahead, you're on the air. Well, I just think this is a very enlightening program, and I think that the doctor's very courageous, and I think that the man who separates his evening from his day, that he was very lucky through his profession to not have carried the addiction into the day, of, day work of this life, which I think takes a lot of discipline even in your other life. Did you carry the addiction into the day? The caller is saying that, that uh, your addiction uh, only took place at night. Did you, did you pop any is, pills uh, during the day? The answer is uh, probably at times I took a pill during the day or um, more days. But uh, again, as far as I know, uh, nobody ever um, stopped me and said, you're not acting right, you're not looking right. Uh, my patients, some very close patients said, we've been worried about you because you always look tired. You always look so haggard. 
Um, and the truth was I've seen pictures of myself back in, uh, back in those days, and I looked terrible. I mean, just I had... But, but you doctor, know. you know that your judgment had to have been sometimes I, impaired. You know, it, there's no sense in going for the, for the sensational in this thing. I might or might, nobody ever right. gave me a, a test, but I'll tell you that there were times as an intern working um, and a resident where I worked 36 hours uh, without sleeping, and I guarantee you that my judgment right. was impaired during those things. Um, the truth is that the studies have been done, and this, this I can tell you, um, physicians who are alcoholic and chemically dependent are not sued for malpractice any more than, than the general population of physicians, and in fact, they're sued less. Okay, now I'm not defending chemically dependent doctors. That's what I do for a living now is to work with, with doctors. I'm the associate director of the Medical Society's Physician Health Program, and I certainly don't defend mm -hmm. this. I'm trying to help them sure. get well. But um, the issue is to just try and get sick people to be well, okay, and that's what's important. Let's go back to the phones. Caller Line 8, you're on the air. Hi. Um, line I, 8? Okay, I think this is a very good program. But I was, I'm a nurse, and I worked in the operating room. We had a surgeon who was an alcoholic. Everyone knew it. Administration knew it. The medical director knew it. He had to be bailed out many times by another surgeon for the mistakes he made while he was under the influence, even in a 7.30 in the morning case. No one did anything. We were told we could do nothing. If the administration didn't take care of us, we opened our mouths, we were in trouble. It's very nice to say you have to get rid of these people when he had no business operating, but how do you do it when the medical profession protects their own? Doctor, good question. Well, in my state, um, it's illegal for a hospital or a physician to know that there's another physician who's alcoholic or chemically impaired and not to call. Um, there, you, a person in, in Massachusetts has two choices. They can call the Board of Registration and Medicine and report this person, or they can call our agency, which is called the Diversion Agency, and we can um, do an intervention on a, on a person to try and, and help them to identify that they have a problem. Doctor, what about the AMA, the, the nurse who was in the operating room and, and, and saw this doctor working, this surgeon working impaired? Couldn't she anonymously Absolutely. report this to the AMA? Or, Don't they have checks and balances? Or to her supervisor. That's the most important she thing. She said she would have been fired, I, but her supervisor knew it. I don't know what to say except that within the hospital, the, the, the people who most report doctors are nurses now. And, and certainly everybody listens to a nurse who says, Dr. Jones showed up in the hospital or in the operating room with alcohol on his breath. Who does the nurse, who does the nurse report to? Well, first of all, she can, in, in our hospitals, she reports it to her supervisor, for sure, or the chief of medicine in the hospital, or the chief of, uh, of the hospital. If nothing is done about the doctor, then those people are legally responsible for this position. And in Massachusetts, I, at I least, they can... I suspect that there are some pretty strong politics in hospitals, though, doctor. Less than you think. Much less than you think. We're trying to, to... I mean, just the stuff we've been talking about. We're trying to do things to help these doctors. And I would stress this is not a moral issue. It's not a moral issue with me. I know a lot of people certainly still think that alcoholism or chemical dependence is a, uh, a moral deal, but it's not. It's an illness. There's recovery possible. Um, our recovery rate for our physicians now from alcohol, 75% um, of the doctors that we see initially never drink again. Okay, we know they're out there. We know that there are physicians practicing right now in this town, surgeons who are perhaps going to operate tomorrow in this town who are chemically addicted, addicted to alcohol. How do we know if it's your doctor or my doctor. We're going to take a short break, and that's the next question I'm going to ask Dr. Michael Palmer. Our phone number is 683-1600. We'll be right back. A touch of cooking, a pinch of dining, a dash of adventure. All the ingredients for incredible edibles as Chef Pierre Frenet leads a gastronomic tour of France. From acclaimed restaurants to favorite bistros, Pierre Frenet is cooking in France. Thursday afternoon at 1. This Friday, celebrate St. Patrick's Day with Irish folk singer Tommy Makem and his friends Barley Bree. Cherish the ladies, Odetta and Pete Seeger. Where do you live, my bunny? Where do you live, my honey? 
house up at the top of the hill, and I lived there with my mummy. And she sang. Enjoy three hours of great Irish tunes on St. Patrick's Day with Tommy Makeup. Friday afternoon, beginning at four, here on WQEX. Welcome back. My guest tonight, Dr. Michael Palmer, and we're talking about uh, chemically addicted uh, doctors, uh, doctors addicted to alcohol. It could be your physician. It could be mine. How do we know? What do we look for? What are the clues? Well, one of the things that we recommend uh, people look for, obviously, is alcohol in the breath of a physician. That's inexcusable, unacceptable at any time in the hospital or in the workplace. But also very easy to cover. I'm sure that oh, you're, no, I'm sure well, your patients the never thing, smelled alcohol on your Well, breath. I never drank in, in association with work at all. But this, the, um, certainly physicians who are heavily or suddenly heavily start doing scents and you smell a lot of cologne in a doctor that you know and you've never smelled it before. Too many breath mints. Too many, well, it's even worse than that sometimes. But um, doctors who suddenly are missing work, your appointment keeps getting changed. Doctors who don't answer phone calls, and you know they once did. Um, doctors whose records are a mess, you can't get records that you want. These are clues that something's wrong. And, and maybe so, it's so mental illness. So just look at the office. See if the office I, is orderly. I think absolutely. See if the doctor looks neat and together, or whether his shirt tail is hanging out. Uh, because I think there's a, there's, there's a certain amount of personal pride in, in your appearance if, if you are a physician. I think so. And um, uh, you, you know, there's some personal. doctors who are innate slobs, but right. uh, by and large, especially changes. If you see changes in the way a doctor that you know is conducting uh, himself or herself, those are reasons I would think to maybe go to another doctor and say, I, I see Dr. Jones and I'm very worried about him. Mm -hmm. Could you talk to him and make sure that he's okay? All right. That's now, a reasonable now, thing to we do. We have the Allegheny County Medical Society. And you, you call. Uh, what, are, what are they empowered to do? Well, I, you know, I don't know uh, Philadelphia as well as I, I mean, uh, Pennsylvania as well as I know yeah. Massachusetts, uh, the Pittsburgh area, but the state of Pennsylvania has a wonderful uh, program of physician assistance uh, okay. run through the state medical. Physicians helping uh, physicians? Yes, exactly. Um, and I'm sure that the County Medical Society uh, could uh, s refer anybody for information to that. Uh, that number. Uh, every state now has physician health services like the one that we have in Massachusetts. Some are not as sophisticated, but the one in Pennsylvania happens to be very sophisticated. Um, and uh, the success rate is wonderful because doctors have a tremendous amount to lose. And so they listen. If, and especially when someone like myself, and there are uh, physicians in our program and every program who are already well into their uh, recovery, someone says, hey, wait a minute, I was like this. I'm like this now. You can do it. You can save your wife. You can save your kids. You can save your profession. This you is what you need lives. to do. And then you can become a doctor and a huge force for good. Right. Okay, let's go back to the stuff. phones, doctor. Caller line seven, you're on the air. Hi. Um, I have to agree with the can previous... Can you speak up a little bit, caller? I have to, pre I have to agree with the previous oh, yeah. caller and uh, say um, you are a very courageous man for doing this. Uh, my question was, um, are there any particular sect, are there a branch of doctors that are more susceptible to this than others? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, I don't have an easy answer to you about that. Uh, what I have found in, in, uh, in our job is that there's a certain sort of type of person that is very susceptible to this disease, and, and those people end up being doctors, and they're the people who who sort of grow up um, with a value system that doesn't have so much to do with right and wrong as approval, disapproval, um, driven people. Um, and in my case, a, a person who ends up with kind of a, a huge emptiness inside. And a lot of physicians uh, enter medicine with a lot of expectations that the profession is going to um, cure their sense of inadequacy or their fears about themselves. And then when the profession disappoints them, when it doesn't deliver, they start to accelerate their drinking or Also, drinking. doctor, you, you, the profession is, is one of, of enormous frustration. You can't save every life. Oh. It is not the, the happiest environment to, to, and when you say you spent maybe 36 hours in an emergency room and you saw pain and tragedy and trauma, 
I suppose you felt very justified by leaving that emergency room and saying, I'm going to have a couple of drinks. Well, I think to some extent I, I justified it by, by doing that. But afterwards, um, when I stopped, it was now 16 years ago, um, I found rewards in medicine sure and the emergency ward that I never and, dreamed about. And uh, the rewards, one of the rewards that he found is uh, by writing wonderful novels. I've got to tell you, Dr. Michael Palmer, I... I, I probably should take some liberty here and ask you how this ends. This is a fantastic suspense novel. Thank I you. have been reading it very, very carefully. Haven't finished it yet, so I really don't know who done it. But I want to wish you the very best, and I want to thank you so much for your courage and for sharing this wonderful story that has a true happy ending. Again, I think if there's one message, is it's to, to pay attention, to look, to try to identify there are monster doctors out there, right? Well, I would say not to judge as well and to try and be as kind to your physician as your physician has been to you because uh, we're all human beings. Okay, Dr. Michael Palmer, thank you again. Join me again next Wednesday night. We're going to be talking about how secure and safe your home is. I'm Elvin Urshano, and remember, the good years start right here. Good night, everyone. thanks those who have made broadcasts of this program possible, our members, and Blue Cross of Western Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania Blue Shield and Integra Bank, serving the communities of Western Pennsylvania for more than 130 years, offering classic choice, a variety of financial services for active savers and investors. Integra Bank, because you want more from your life and more from your bank. The bank for times like these. And by St. Margaret Memorial Hospital, enriching the lives of seniors and their families. If you're older, you're in capable hands at St. Margaret. For more information, call 784-4144.